There are two things that people are always told not to talk about at the dinner table. Religion and politics. They're the conversational third rail that can transform a happy Thanksgiving dinner into a family royal rumble complete with elbow drops and chair slams. But in this video, we're going to go there. We're going to talk about religion and politics, and we're going to look at how religion and politics divided France in the same way that it divides Thanksgiving tables all over this country. Okay, let's get going. In this lesson, you're going to need something to take notes with, and one primary source, the decree on the clerical oath. But before we get going on the French church and the way that religion and politics divided France, we have to talk about something that we haven't really discussed in a little while, and that's the French financial crisis. Remember way back in week two? One of the very first things we talked about when we started to discuss the origins of the French Revolution was the fiscal crisis and the massive debt that the French monarchy incurred over the course of the 18th century. It was the reason for the calling of the Estates General. It opened the door to the revolution. Since then, however, uh, we really haven't spoken much about it. What happened to the debt and what happened to the fiscal crisis? Well, the short answer is that it was still there. While the Estates General had transformed itself into the National Assembly and the people of Paris had stormed the Bastille and marched to Versailles, and the National Assembly had declared universal rights of the French people. Amidst all this, the debt remained. And the National Assembly really had two options. They could choose to deal with it, or they could default on the loans. The easiest solution was simply to default, to say, hey, that's the king's debt and not the nation's debt, and so the National Assembly isn't going to do anything about it. Good luck, Louis. But from very early on, people in the National Assembly felt this was a bad idea. Defaulting on loan repayments or passing the buck would weaken the credibility of an already less than stable political institution in the new National Assembly. Plus, many of the Assembly's members were debt holders. They were the ones who were owed money by the monarchy. They didn't want to take the personal loss. Finally, the greatest fear was that defaulting on the loans would create a financial meltdown, the likes of which France had never seen. So most agreed that the National Assembly had to do something to solve the financial problems of the monarchy. Adding to those problems was the fact that tax collection had almost completely stopped throughout France in the summer of 1789. The provincial revolts of July and August saw toll gates destroyed, tax offices raided, records burned. Tax collectors largely gave up on their jobs because no one was paying taxes anymore. The result was that the government had a lot less money. In Picardy, for example, indirect tax revenues fell by 80% in the fall of 1789. The National Assembly, intent on solving the financial crisis, saw itself without a stable source of revenue, which is a big, big problem if you're going to solve a financial crisis. So what do you do? Well, the first big idea came from none other than Jacques Necker in September 1789. Necker came before the National Assembly and called for a patriotic contribution from every household in France. The idea was that since the National Assembly now existed, and since the French people now had a stake in the nation, and thus the nation's finances, they could be prevailed upon to sacrifice for its survival. Ne Necker made the small ask of just 25% of every citizen's income in cash to be donated to the state for the next three years. Just a quarter of everyone's incomes. You know, not a big deal. Necker launched the effort himself by presenting the assembly with 100,000 livres of his own money to the assembled members. And this guy was a Genevan. He wasn't even French. Very romantic. The idea was idealistic, to say the least, and it had its flaws right from the outset. First, there was no mechanism for enforcing or even collecting the patriotic contributions of the nation. Contributions were to be completely voluntary. Had there been effective mechanisms for collection, then the National Assembly could have simply used them to collect taxes and not had to call for some voluntary contribution from all citizens. Necker was betting on the goodwill of the people. 
but he was sorely disappointed. By March 1790, six months after Necker's initial call, the state had only collected 1.042 million livres in donations, 100,000 of which, so roughly 10%, was Necker's original gift. Disgraced and probably disappointed, Necker finally resigned, and for the last time, in the fall of 1790. So, back to the drawing board. What to do with the debt? It was already in the closing months of 1789, as Necker's plan was still in effect, that some began proposing some more radical measures. One such plan came from the Bishop of Autun, Charles, uh, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand, a liberal member of the upper clergy, and a guy who we'll hear a lot more about as the course goes on. Talleyrand was like Sies, a sort of career clergyman who was really interested in the revolution. On October 10th, 1789, Talleyrand came before the assembly and proposed that the state pay off its debts by nationalizing the property of the Catholic Church. The church, as you may remember, was one of the largest single landowners in all of France. Beside the properties that individual parishes and cathedrals stood on, abbots, bishops, and other members of the church were landlords for a great many estates throughout the kingdom. Talleyrand argued that if the state simply took control of all that property, they could use it to pay off the massive debt. Still a member of the church, Talleyrand suggested that two-thirds of the money made from the property would need to be given back to the church in the form of clerical payments so that priests and bishops could still make ends meet, but the remaining third could simply be put to servicing the debt. Others, however, took the idea even further. Mirabeau, that firebrand nobleman turned third estate representative and leader of the National Assembly, suggested that, in fact, the church's lands were not the clergy's, for the clergy as a separate, distinct order no longer existed. And since individual clergymen had no specific titles to the land that they exacted revenues from, they had no claims to those lands. Now that privileged orders and groups were gone, all property ownership was only ownership by an individual. Anything not owned by an individual was simply the purview of the state. Mirabeau thus suggested that the state nationalize church lands, but that they not be constrained to reserve part of it for proceeds for the clergy. They could do with the money what they wanted. All of it could go to the servicing of the debt. Mirabeau's plan eventually went up for a vote, and it passed overwhelmingly in the National Assembly, 568 to 346. The question, however, became how to pull this off. This is a big ask. How does a government take over land and then make money off of it, and especially this much land? Well, the first thing that was decided was that the government couldn't simply claim all of the land and sell it all off at once. That would flood the market and drive down prices. They had to be systematic. So they devised a system for collecting money and auctioning off the lands gradually. The system revolved around newly issued bonds called assignats, paper bills given in exchange for money. A state would then auction off church lands gradually, and at these auctions, only assignat would be used as, as the means of purchase. The National Assembly issued 400 million livres worth of assignats in its first issue. Each assignat was worth 1,000 livres. All the money from the assignat would be placed in an extraordinary fund and then used to pay off the national debt. Assignats were incredibly important, but also a bit confusing to understand. So, in order to understand them a little bit better, we're going to turn to our financial consultant, insider trader, and skeezy con artist, Watkins. Let's see what he has to say. Alright, psst. I got a good investment tip for you here, okay? These assignats, great investment opportunity. These assignats are so great, hottest thing on the market right now. All you have to do, right, is you buy a bunch of these assignats and you hang on to them. You can use them to buy church property or whatever, or you can just sell them off to other people, right? These things are going for over face value these days. You just buy some, sell them off to other people, you can use them just like money. It's great. My guys are telling me these are going for like 5 6% above face value right now. Demand is off the charts. You've got this. All you got to do is buy a few of these assignats when they come available from the National Assembly and you're golden. And so I can get them for you real easy. All you have to do is just text me your bank account information and your financial... Uh... Okay, okay, okay. We got to shut that down. Students, don't send your financial information to anyone you don't know, okay? Skeezy Watkins, however, was kind of right. Assignats became great investment opportunities. People started buying them whenever they were available, and they started buying them for higher than their face value. 
Austin yachts were so lucrative that the National Assembly eventually just decided to print more, and people jumped on those new Austin yachts as well. In addition, they started trading those Austin yachts and using Austin yachts to purchase other things, other things of value. And so effectively, Austin yachts became pieces of currency. They became a money in and of themselves. In fact, this was so prominent that the National Assembly recognized this and decided to make Austin yachts an official currency with legal tender in revolutionary France. Austin yachts became revolutionary France's money. From April to September 1790, the National Assembly went forward with six more waves of Austin yacht sales. And those Austin yacht sales went wild. People gobbled them up. In fact, by the end of September 1790, by September 29th, there was an estimated 1.2 billion livres in Austin yachts in circulation in revolutionary France. But Austin yachts became much more. They became symbols of the revolution. You see, people only bought Austin yachts if they had faith that the revolutionary government, first of all, would last, and second of all, would honor its commitments to sell off church property. And in this way, it also affirmed people's attachments to the revolution, people's approval of the revolution, and approval of the revolutionary government's decisions to nationalize church lands and to sell them off for a profit. And as Skeezy Watkins kind of indicated, Austin Yachts also became a way for many people to make lots and lots of money during the revolution. Austin Yachts were a new vehicle for financial gain, in a way that many people became rich because of the revolution. But what did all this mean for the church? Well, the decision to nationalize church property was only one of the many changes that the National Assembly took on and made to the Catholic Church in the first years of the Revolution. And it's the kind of collection of all of these changes that ended up leading to division and even schism in the Church. The Catholic Church lost quite a bit in the opening months of the Revolution. In the magical session of August the 4th, parish priests lost their tithes, their main source of income in the abolition of feudal dues. And the papacy lost its annual annate sent on behalf of the, Gath uh, of the Gallican Church. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, much to many sh clergymen's chagrin, allowed for freedom of expression and freedom of religious conscience, thus chipping away at the religious and cultural hegemony of the Catholic Church. Things got worse in the months that followed. On November 2nd, 1789, there was the aforementioned vote on the nationalization of church property. On February 13th, 1790, the National Assembly officially dissolved monasteries and convents, deeming them privileged corporations and thus not in the public interest. And they prohibited the introduction of new religious vows. The revolution was already having a tremendous impact on the state of the church. In August 1789, the National Assembly also decided that they would take it upon themselves to reform the church and make it more consistent with the new order. They formed a special ecclesiastical committee and tasked it with ensuring that the church was in accord with the new revolution's values. The committee worked for the better part of a year, and then they came out with their new plan. What if we made the Catholic Church a part of the state? What if the church became a part of the political bureaucracy? It could no longer be a privileged institution. That, that was clear. But many revolutionaries still felt that it served a purpose, or could serve a purpose, for the nation. The task was to make sure that the church was fulfilling that purpose on behalf of the nation. So, on July 12, 1790, the National Assembly voted on the Civil Constitution of the Clergy, a new law that would totally transform the Catholic Church in France and make it, officially, a wing of the state. The Civil Constitution made all priests salaried employees of the state. It placed restrictions on their activities, for example, mandating that clergymen actually reside in the diocese that they were assigned to so that they could do the work of charity and service that they were tasked for do with doing. It redrew the ecclesiastical map and made dioceses the same as departments so that they could all function within the same bureaucracy. It placed a bishop at the head of each diocese slash department and thus eliminated a bunch of episcopal positions and effectively creating new ones. It mandated how many parishes could exist in towns, how many, right, the, the number, and cities of, of various sizes, effectively decreasing the number of parishes throughout France. Finally, and perhaps most radically, it made clerical positions elected positions. Citizens would vote on their parish priest. 
and bishops just as they elected their representatives to the National Assembly. On August 24, 1790, the king agreed to sign the new civil constitution into law. There were many in the church that were nervous about these changes and many that refused to cooperate with them. To force clergymen to cooperate, in November 1790, the National Assembly passed an additional law that forced all members of the clergy to take an oath of loyalty in front of a crowd of witnesses to the nation and to the revolutionary government. For many clergymen, whose memories allowed them to think about the controversies over the refusal of sacraments and other oath-taking issues in the past, this seemed like too much. Taking an oath to the nation and to the state seemed to be in conflict to the vows that they took toward God and the church. It became a, a power struggle for the allegiance of Catholic priests. To get a sense of this, I want you to pause this video and read the primary source that I mentioned before, the Decree on the Clerical Oath. This document is going to give you a little bit of a sense of why so many clergymen were so nervous about the mandate to take an oath to the nation. The decree is not a very long one, but it's rich with meaning. One thing that I think you should pay attention to the most is the end, when the National Assembly sets forth what the consequences are for not taking the oath. And here's what they say. In the case where bishops, former archbishops and priests, fail to take the oath, they will not only be deprived of their salary or pension, but also their rights as French citizens will be declared forfeit, and they will be incapable of any public offices. In the same way, all ecclesiastical or secular persons who ally themselves to form or to excite opposition to the decrees of the National Assembly sanctioned by the king will be pursued and punished for having disrupted the public peace. Clergy who refused to take the oath forfeited their salaries and their very rights as active citizens. Plus, that final paragraph stipulates that the consequences could be even greater. If it's determined that a priest's words or actions were deemed in opposition to the decrees of the National Assembly, then they could be prosecuted for disturbing the public peace. This decree opened the door for a massive controversy in the church, and in many ways, the first clear definition of the revolution's enemies. The civil constitution of the clergy and the clerical oath totally divided the French Catholic Church but it also produced tensions within the revolutionary state itself. And so what you'll see going forward is how religion became one of the main things to divide the state in the early years of the revolution. All of this might have turned out okay had the Pope at the time, Pius VI, weighed in and urged priests and bishops to go along with the changes mandated by the state. But the reality is that the civil constitution did much to strip the papacy of many of the rights that it had always held for itself. The papacy was the institution that drew out bishoprics and appointed bishops. The civil constitution became a power struggle for the pope over his control of the church in France. And strangely, uh, even though this power struggle was evident right away, he did not say this immediately. Pius VI remained silent for the first few months of the civil constitution. This opened the door to schism in the French church. The clergy was divided over whether to take the oath or not. Within the National Assembly itself, 109 of the clerical representatives took the oath immediately, but only two of them were bishops, and one of those was Talleyrand. In some areas, a large percentage of the clergy went along with the new changes. In Paris and its environs, and in the Pyrenees and the, south and the southeast, oath-taking was really high. In other parts of France, however, rates could be very, very low. In Flanders and Alsace, less than 25% of the clergy agreed to take the oath. And in the West, the number of refractory clergy, aka the number of clergy who refused to take the oath, was equally high. Altogether, about 54% of the clergy in France took the oath initially. Thus, the civil constitution literally split the clergy in half. In April 1791, the Pope finally broke his silence and spoke out on the issue. In a papal bull titled Caritas, the Pope unequivocally denounced the new civil constitution and instructed all clergymen to either go back on their oaths or remain steadfast in their defiance if they had rejected the oath originally. Caritas convinced about 10% of oath-taking priests to go back on their oaths to renounce them in public. The king himself got rid of his oath-taking confessor after the papal bull and brought in a refractory priest. Parisians and many supporters of the revolution responded by burning effigies of the Pope in public 
and disrupting the services of refractory priests. Images, such as the one you're seeing here, <laughs> started to get published and distributed throughout France, mocking the Pope, the Church, the Papal Bull Caritas, and those who refused to go along with the plans of the National Assembly. And it's no wonder that the Pope's words had such an effect on members of the Church and um, everyone in France. This is how the Pope ended his Papal Bull. He wrote, Take special care, talking to clergymen, lest you proffer ears to the insidious voices of this secular sect, whose voices furnish death, and avoid in this way all usurpers, whether they are called archbishops, bishops, or parish priests, so that there is nothing in common between you and them, especially in divine matters. In one word, cling to us, us being the papacy here, for no one can be in the Church of Christ unless he is unified with the visible head of the church itself and is strengthened in the cathedral of Peter. If we're looking for ways that the harmony of the early revolution, the ways that the spirit of 1789 sort of cracked and fell apart, well, we can't ignore the effect of the civil constitution of the clergy, the rejection of that civil constitution by the Pope, and the division that it caused within the clergy, within the Catholic Church in France. The affair over the civil constitution of the clergy didn't stop in 1791. It continued to divide people in France, and it continued to set a part of the church against the revolutionary state. And so in this way, the affair over the civil constitution of the clergy effectively created revolutionary France's first official enemies, people that were defined as being against the revolution itself. In other words, it created the first counter-revolutionaries. Okay, that's it for this video. Good job. Uh, bring your notes to class, and I'll see you soon.